There's more and more research around some of the holistic benefits of paying attention not only to, to uh, things like exercise, but also nutrition. And so we know that uh, that's an area that we wanted to venture into to provide you with some additional information and resources. So this afternoon is devoted to uh, more of a holistic approach to managing your Parkinson's disease. And besides the speaker on nutrition, we also have a speaker on mindfulness. And that, um, you got a little bit of taste of that in terms of the power of the mind over the body and how you can actually, if you think something is good for you or you're enjoying yourself, you are producing some dopamine. Uh, so in a sense, that's what the uh, mindfulness piece uh, is uh, focusing on. But for now, we're going to look at the, uh, what you can do in terms of what you're putting into your body uh, besides medication. And uh, so that is eating well with Parkinson's disease. And we have with us Alicia Boski, who is uh, going to speak on nutrition. She is a registered dietitian. She holds a Master's of Science from the University of Victoria. And she's worked in a variety of clinical community research and policy settings, including BC Cancer, uh, the Victoria Native Friendship Centre, and Salvation Army. And she's really, uh, as well, during that time, uh, developed a passion for um, and, and contributed to healthy public policy and issues in health equity, especially around research on charitable food programs across Canada and food insecurity. She's currently on maternity leave this year. But she does hold a position with the Ministry of Advanced Education, where she contributes to provincial health education planning and policy in Victoria, BC. So we have a presentation, and then similar to the morning speakers, there will be a question and answer period at the end of her presentation. So please join with me in welcoming Alicia. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Jean mentioned, I'm an expert in nutrition. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, I also have a personal interest in Parkinson's, as my mom, and my mom has Parkinson's. So I wanted to be able to contribute and support uh, this organization. I, uh, with that, um, there may be some questions specifically that you have, perhaps even around medications and nutrition that I may not be able to answer. Um, that's my disclaimer. But I will provide you with some resources and, and, and folks that you can um, be in touch with if you have something specific that I can't answer. Or, you know, even if you've heard the presentation today and sort of later on, um, you know, have some different questions that, that come up. Um, we do have a service in BC called HealthLink BC. And uh, you may be familiar with the nurses there. Uh, um, they have a nurse line, they have pharmacists there, but they also have registered dietitians. And you can call them, it's a free resource in BC and they have um, a lot of information. Um, and actually, the presentation that I've put together today um, has been compiled by my colleagues there, um, as well as with the Dietitians of Canada. And they've sort of really compiled uh, literature and sort of best practice across um, the world, really, New Zealand, Japan, uh, US, Australia, um, compiled all of these sort of key practice points that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so, uh, so the information and education that I'm bringing has not been individualized at all. Um, and it's not meant to replace any of the advice from your medical uh, doctor or sort of individualized counseling that you may have had with a dietitian um, or that you may receive in the future. Um, because we know that really Parkinson's itself and the medication can cause nutrition concerns. So um, because, you know, this can affect, you know, uh, um, really anything uh, sort of related to, like Parkinson's can affect anything, the neurological sort of um, processes within your whole gastrointestinal tract, but can also affect the way that you're, uh, you know, may become able to prepare meals, um, and procure um, activities of daily living, this kind of thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, that piece around sort of managing some of these symptoms. So again, uh, the nutrition sort of nutritional needs are very individualized. Um, this is general information, and you you may sort of find that as your Parkinson's progresses progresses, uh, you may experience different symptoms, and you and um, this presentation today is really intended to look at some of those things that you may encounter and, and um, you know, where you can go to get help and, and um, yeah, some ideas there. So as we go through this, I 
do want you to sort of hold your questions to the end, but if something, you know, if you have a burning question or something's really not clear as I'm going through this, um, go ahead and raise your hand and we can sort of address it and not wait till the end because then you probably forgot your question by then anyway. Okay. So I have divided the next sort of 40 minutes or 45 minutes or so uh, reserving about 10 to 15 for questions into four categories. The first is about staying healthy. What can we do uh, to optimize our health and well-being with nutrition um, by eating well? Uh, second is how to keep your bones healthy. We know that uh, studies have shown uh, very high rates of vitamin D insufficiency and osteoporosis for people with Parkinson's. So we're going to talk about how uh, you can optimize uh, your nutrition to keep your bones healthy. Uh, third, I'm going to go through sort of a series of different symptoms that are commonly experienced, typically experienced by people with Parkinson's, and some, some tips on how to sort of manage that. I talked about some of those things around um, sort of the gastrointestinal tract, but everything from, um, you know, constipation to difficulty swallowing, uh, reflux, um, and often a speech language pathologist or swallowing assessment uh, can be done it, along with a dietitian to sort of optimize that, uh, looking at swallowing as well. And uh, sort of the last section I've included is special considerations, um, but really this is looking at some of the, the things in the research. So you might have heard of sort of coenzyme Q10 or uh, vitamin E. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about these sort of different supplements um, as well as a little bit about protein uh, redistribution diets and a little bit about hypotension. So I'm going to include that at the, at the very end. So eating well uh, with Parkinson's and to stay healthy is really the advice that I would give, uh, you know, not just to anyone with Parkinson's, but to, to anyone in general. Um, you know, a balanced, nutritious diet, including all of the food groups, limiting sugar, salt, and alcohol, um, you know, trying not to skip meals, probably all this information that you probably know already. Um, lots of vegetables and fruits. We see a lot of the dark green ones and the orange ones. Um, are some of the most nutritious ones. Higher fiber, uh, grain products, whole grains um, tend to have more of the vitamins and minerals that support our immune system um, and keep things moving through. <laughs> uh, milk, cheese, yogurt, fortified beverages, these are the types that provide us and keep our bones healthy with calcium um, and vitamin D. Uh, leaner meats, uh, skinless poultry, fish, um, you may have heard about with omega-3s has an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, eggs, legumes, um, sort of eating a wide variety of these and trying to have, not skipping meals, but trying to have, um, you know, regular meals every day. Uh, has anyone seen sort of Canada's food guide or taken a look at it? It's kind of a big document and it's quite I think a little bit overwhelming, even though I'm a dietitian and I do support it. Um, but it, it talks about sort of not really what you should eat and, and what types of amounts. So it's worthwhile taking a look at it. Um, but I don't like to be too, too prescriptive. And actually on the next slide, I'm going to give you sort of a, the one minute advice um, that, that I kind of like about eating well. Um, but, but with Parkinson's, I think thinking about staying healthy and eating well, um, what we see very commonly in people with Parkinson's is that probably like the general population, um, uh, in early stages, many people tend to be overweight or a little bit overweight, but that's probably the general population and, you know, at, at that age group. Uh, but that is very, very common um, for people to lose weight um, as, as the disease progresses. progresses. And really this weight loss, um, what they found in studies is that uh, they're not totally sure where it comes, whether it's a reduced intake or whether there's increased energy um, through the progression of the disease, um, energy expenditure, um, or whether there's some malabsorption. They're not totally sure, but what they do know is that once that weight loss occurs, it's very hard, especially if someone slips before, below sort of a healthy weight, to sort of regain that weight um, to a healthy range. And what happens is this really reduces um, nutrition, it can really affect our immune system, and uh, it also can um, put us at more at risk during things like falls, 
Um, again, getting, you know, getting the flu when it comes around because you're not getting enough protein, that type of thing. So it is really uh, recommended that, um, you, know, if, you know, if you are overweight or you want to lose weight, that you don't actually go on a very calorie-restricted diet because you don't want to sort of put yourself at risk of going um, sort of below. And you do want to sort of uh, make sure you have some, some supplies for when, when times aren't, you know, uh, you know, as good in terms of eating, um, that you'd fall too far below sort of a recommended healthy weight. <clears throat> so weight stabilization is really re recommended by eating sort of a, you know, a balanced, nutritious foods, um, controlling portions and exercising um, you know, as your symptoms allow and as um, you know, physically you're able to. Uh, sort of the third bullet here is, uh, again, uh, maintaining a healthy weight, but eating regularly. So you may find, um, you know, if, if you don't have the same appetite as you used to, you may find that if you're one of those people who ate three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you may find that you actually need to have four smaller meals or five smaller meals um, in the day. But, um, you know, and trying to get a, a sort of a protein or a balance of um, food groups throughout the, all of those meals. And then the last sort of bullet I have here is to, to get help and to get help early. And this can mean different things. It can mean talking to a dietitian. It can mean, you know, meals on wheels or... Um, you know, getting help from family members or looking at, you know, different frozen meal services and things like that, um, depending where you want to put your energy. But, you know, eating healthy will really help to optimize your health. And so it's really important that um, you look at different ways of, of getting help when before you really need it. <laughs> this came across my desk. Uh, and I kind of like it because, like I, I talked about the food guide, it's really a big document and it's a little bit overwhelming in my opinion. And I like this because it's kind of like, what can you eat more of, what can you eat less of, switch to. It's like three kind of key messages and, you know, it's, it's nice and clean and clear. And what actually Sweden has done, so this comes from Sweden. And, um, and actually I got this from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the US, and they actually have a lot of different food guides from around the world there, and, and just different perspectives. It's all really built on the same evidence base, um, but it's kind of how it's presented. And it, it's, it's less prescriptive and kind of like easy, easy things to do. So, I mean, you can read that there. Eating more, uh, what can you do more of? Vegetables, nuts and seeds, exercise. Um, the other thing I like about it is it actually focuses a little bit on environment and sustainability. Um, you know, it talks about switching away from palm oils because they're not as good for the environment, but to more canola oil and um, olive oil. So, you know, if you are interested, it's something to look at, but otherwise you might just like sort of the one minute advice, like I like it. <laughs> so a little bit about um, osteoporosis. I mentioned before that studies have shown, oops, that didn't go. Oh, sure. Sure, so it says more uh, vegetables, fruit, and berries, fish and s shellfish, nuts and seeds and exercise, switching to whole grain, um, healthy fats, uh, so that's where I mentioned sort of the palm oil, shifting away from sort of palm oil or saturated fats to more your plant-based fats, uh, low-fat dairy products, uh, less red meat and processed meat, salt, sugar, and alcohol. So it's kind of those are sort of the, the key messages that they want to go through. And they actually have a, a document if you want, actually are interested in looking at this more um, on the FAO website, um, which goes into detail about each one of those things. But this is sort of their key, key messages. And um, um, our food guide doesn't quite, quite have a very one minute advice. It's kind of <laughs> a, little, a little more elaborate. OK, there we go. So keeping your bones healthy, as I mentioned, people with Parkinson's are, are at higher risk of osteoporosis. So the recommendations for calcium vitamin D are on the higher end um, of, of the recommendations, and this is to support bone health. So this is both from foods as well as from supplements. So um, what I'll talk about in the next slide is actually that it 
for, for many people, getting this amount of calcium is achievable in, in a day, but typically vitamin D, it's a little bit harder to get. You might have heard of vitamin D as a sunshine vitamin, um, but it's beautiful out today, and we're inside. Uh, but it has been very rainy lately, and it's really hard for more, most North Americans to get enough vitamin D just um, from the sunshine alone. Um, so I'll talk about some different food sources, but many people find that they actually need a supplement for vitamin D. Um, and then the last one here is to aim for 30 minutes of weight-bearing activity every day. And this can be uh, walking, you know, dancing, um, whatever, you, you know, whatever you, you can do, aerobics, um, you know, and connecting with the physio definitely can, can help with finding what activity is going to work, work in your lifestyle. So calcium-based foods, um, I mentioned 1,200 milligrams a day. If you can get sort of, if you typically get about three to four servings of calcium-type foods in a day, you probably don't need a supplement. But if, but if you're a person that doesn't eat a lot of dairy, basically dairy foods, it can be harder to, and, and you probably want to talk with um, uh, a pharmacist at the local pharmacy to, to look at what kind of supplement is best for you. Um, typically a serving of um, calcium type foods would be about a cup of milk. It can also be uh, fortified soy or rice beverages as long as they're fortified with calcium. Um, cheeses, you actually only need about an ounce and a half of cheese to be considered like one serving. Um, uh, about three quarters or a cup of yogurt um, is typically a serving. Uh, you know, milk and dairy foods are not necessarily your only source of calcium, but they're typically the easiest absorbed and easiest to get because they have a high amount of calcium. Um, broccoli is actually an excellent source of calcium, but a serving would be about a cup, so, um, or other green leafy vegetables. So, again, if you're getting about two to three servings of dairy and then you're eating, you know, dark leafy greens, um, almonds are another good source of um, calcium. Um, then you're probably doing okay. Uh, if you do decide to supplement calcium, it's, it's important that you don't over supplement. So again, you can connect with your uh, pharmacist about this, but if you're having amounts up to 2,000 or 2,500, it can actually be detrimental to your health. So you do wanna get a, um, you know, you don't wanna supplement if you're already having a lot of these foods and you don't wanna over supplement. Um, there's not as many natural food sources of vitamin D. Um, again, the sun, is an excellent source of vitamin D. We don't get it <laughs> that much. Um, salmon is probably one of the best food sources of vitamin D, but again, it's not something that we can get every day. Um, so vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, um, and salmon's a very good source. Eggs are okay. Two eggs would be about 100. Um, I use is the unit measure for vitamin D, but Unless you're having, you know, let's see, two times six, you'd be have, have to be having 12, a dozen eggs a day, which you're not having a dozen eggs a day, you know, to get the vitamin D that you need in the day. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, you're not having salmon every day. Uh, um, milk does have some vitamin D, but again, a cup would be about 100 IUs. It's not, comes close to the your six to 800 that, you're, that we recommended on the previous slide there. Um, the 800 level is if you're 70 or over. Uh, the 600 is um, the recommendation otherwise. Uh, one other thing I'll just say about vitamin D, you can also get too much. Health Canada recommends not getting more than five or 4,000 IUs in a day, uh, which is quite high. Um, so you're safe uh, you know, to have a daily supplement of vitamin D and then also get those natural food sources. Uh, the literature also says that um, if you that studies have shown if uh, you know you or someone you care for is very restricted in activity, um, that you actually should speak with your physician about taking supplements because I think um, there were some cases where people had very high level, very health detrimental levels of calcium um, by supplementing because um, they they weren't able to move and get around. So worth something to to state there. 
Vitamin D also uh, is a very key component in the immune system. So, um, uh, uh, you know, another key vitamin, not just for your bones, but for your immune system as well. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk at a pretty high level about managing some of the symptoms, just so, the, so you, that you're aware of some of the things that you might come across, maybe you have come across them, and some tips on how you might be able to manage those with nutrition and diet. As I mentioned, um, the symptoms that I'm going to talk about nutrition related um, are related to the sort of the neurological progression of the disease. So it's, it's due to the motility um, in your gastro, gastro, gastrointestinal tract. Um, and one of the key, key components can be working with um, a speech language pathologist who can do sort of a swallowing assessment, particularly around swallowing sort of early and um, often in, as, the, as your condition progresses. Um, so we're going to sort of start at the bottom, constipation, and sort of work our way up to sort of swallowing um, and uh, d movement, um, dysmobility. And of course, these GI symptoms, you know, are typically connect to sort of risk for poor nutrition intake and, and weight loss. And so one, this is one of the things that we want to optimize. Um, Starting with constipation, sort of treatment, you know, with nutrition for constipation is to eat a high fiber diet. Um, you know, we talked about that with healthy eating anyway, but it's, in, it's extremely important if you are increasing the fiber in your diet that you can also get the amount of fluids that you need to make sure that that fiber works well. Because if you just increase your fiber and you don't, you're not drinking two liters of water a day, you're going to actually have the opposite effect um, and become more constipated. Um, and as well, exercise um, as often as you can can help to keep things moving. Um, I find even eating just a lot of vegetables and whole grains, it can be very difficult to get enough fiber to kind of keep things moving through. So sometimes like all bran or bran buds can be really a good way to get the fiber in. But again, um, that high fiber shouldn't be uh, consumed unless you can get that, that fluid in. And often people, you know, go to medication in order to treat constipation because nutrition alone isn't enough, um, but sometimes you can just manage it with nutrition alone. Um, one of the other things uh, I was going to mention about constipation has slipped my mind, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, reduced gastric mo motility, um, so sort of moving up the GI GI, so we talk about the lower bowel, um, talking about the stomach as well. So um, what can happen is that your stomach actually may not empty quite sort of in the, in the same manner as it did as your disease progresses. progresses. Um, and so this can lead to sort of poor appetite um, or some nausea. Again, I mentioned before, um, you know, if you don't have that same appetite, small frequent meals um, can be the best way to achieve the same sort of nutritional intake. Um, try to have each of those small frequent meals with a protein-based food like a meat or a dairy product just to ensure that you get a balance of nutrition and balancing your blood sugars over the day. Uh, ginger ale can also reduce nausea. Often nausea can be related to medications. Um, a change in medications or a start of medication, which, which often resolves on its own, but taking medications with a small meal or a snack, and probably your uh, physician has, has spoken with you about that. Heartburn, reflux, and bloating. Again, this can be a symptom of this sort of delayed gastric emptying or um, dysmobility in the uh, gastrointestinal tract in the stomach, but it also can be related to sort of swallowing in this reflux. Um, small frequent meals, again, uh, can be really helpful here because it's not such a load on the stomach. Um, limiting or avoiding alcohol, caffeine, or carbonated drinks can often help with reflux as well. Um, and heartburn, <clears throat> sitting upright after meals, sometimes up to an hour after a meal, um, can really help with heartburn. And limiting any foods that might trigger symptoms. So here is listed spices, peppermint, chocolate, uh, citrus juices, onions, garlic, tomatoes. These are some of the foods that can commonly cause reflux or heartburn. 
Um, but a lot of people find that like a, a food diary uh, can help to sort of identify which foods are causing which symptoms. And um, you know, you may find that avoiding some of these can help. And then the last comment here is that uh, straws or sucking on hard candy can actually contribute to gas and bloating. So you might find that by not doing that can, can help with um, those. Um, difficulty swallowing. Um, this difficulty swallowing is, is really individualized, is highly individualized. So I'm not going to talk too much about it here. But typically, um, it's best managed using a speech language pathologist to do a swallowing assessment early on and then to reevaluate that swallowing um, sort of over, over time. And then really working, if you can work with a dietitian to look at, um, you know, together with the, the swallowing assessment to look at how you can sort of maximize the foods that you like, um, you know, and, and making those work within sort of the restrictions that, that you need. Um, problems, am I on the right? Yep. Problems moving the jaw, lips, or tongue, um, and you know, as well as slow and uncontrolled movements. So, um, any difficulties getting sort of food in, um, and again, that's probably linked to you know preparing meals and preparing them in a way that you know works best for your health. Um, so. You can see here, sometimes softer foods work better. Sauces and gravies tend to be to work well for, for people that have difficulties sort of moving their jaw, lips, and tongue. Um, you know, different textures of foods, so even mincing foods, foods can be, you know, um, better. Um, not skipping meals, again, sort of smaller, more frequent meals, uh, allowing lots of time to eat, so a quiet setting. Sometimes people can be quite self-conscious, so it's nicer to have meals at home rather than out or with lots of company. Um, again, smaller portions or pre-cut foods and finger foods can, um, can be the best ways to sort of and tips to manage, manage these symptoms. Okay, so I'm down to sort of the last uh, section around special considerations, um, and then we'll have some time for questions if that uh, works for everyone. So um, a little bit, and this is definitely uh, you know the area that I don't um, can't speak a lot to, but you may have heard that uh, protein can actually f affect absorption. Um, of, of medication for, for some folks, but this is actually, um, you know, in, in the information that I have, this is actually found that um, for most individuals, the timing of protein actually plays no role in the effectiveness of medication, and that protein is actually very important to maintain optimal health. I mentioned it before, it plays a big role in supporting the immune system, um, supporting your muscles and strength. Um, it also has a lot of role, a uh, big role in sort of enzyme activity in your body, so your ability to um, uh, metabolize and do other sort of the chemical reactions that it needs to do. Um, so really the advice is to follow the food guide to get enough protein um, every day. And, you know, what, what I would say is think about always having a protein at your meals, but also to include a protein food at your snacks as well. That'll help you ensure that you get enough protein over the day. Uh, as I mentioned, there are very f few individuals that can be impacted sort of by, um, you know, medication absorption with high protein meals. And what, what um, typically the plan is, is they do what's called a protein re redistribution diet, um, where they try to uh, redistribute their protein into sort of a supper meal so that their medication is absorbed better during the day. However, this is really um, a diet that you want to sort of work with your, you know, very closely with a physician on. Um, it can lead, you know, to weight loss and, and low protein intake. Um, so it shouldn't really be continued for too long and it should be sort of supervised. And um, there's actually, there actually does need to be a lot more research done in terms of clinical trials to establish whether or not this is, um, you know, this type of diet actually can, can achieve the greatest benefit and, you know, um, greatest medication. 
Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about on this slide is um, sort of what's called orthostatic hypotension. And this can be quite common. Um, so low pressure, blood, low bread, blood pressure, um, when you sort of stand up and you get a little bit dizzy. Um, again, talk to your doctor. Obviously, if you're getting dizzy, this can, you know, this can lead to a fall or something like that, which can have, um, you know, poor, poor impacts for sure. So there may be some things you can do in terms of nutrition um, for hypotension, and this would be increasing your salt and fluid intake, but you need to sort of look at sort of managing this with your doctor, but that is something you, could, you can talk to them about. The last thing I wanted to talk about is some of these, um, what you may call sort of wonder foods or, or supplements. You may have, you may have seen this in a in a journal, or you may have may, a friend may have showed you something about this. Um, and the thing that that is sort of always hard to translate is sort of the, the evidence and the scientific studies and then translating that into what we should recommend for everybody. And that's an extremely hard thing to do because, you know, sometimes studies can be 10 people, right? Um, you know, we need sort of consistent big studies, you know, with, with certain amounts. Um, you know, to really, to really kind of recommend to everyone that we should, you know, absolutely take this. Um, and then there's also other confounding factors. So depending on the group and the control group, um, there's lots of other things that can affect um, how Parkinson's progresses um, and even prevention. Some of the, some of the literature looks, on, looks at prevention as well. But some of the key foods um, that you may have heard of is the first uh, have up here is coenzyme um, Q10, which is a naturally occurring uh, coenzyme in our body. Um, and they found that uh, individuals with Parkinson's can have low plasma levels, so low levels of this coenzyme Q10 in our blood. However, some, only some small trials have demonstrated some benefits of actually um, supplementing this coenzyme Q10 to, to slow the progression um, of Parkinson's. Uh, so they found some benefits, but they actually did a recent large trial, and they didn't find any benefits of actually having coenzyme Q10 at about 1,200 milligrams a day compared to sort of a placebo group. And they looked at it over a three-month um, sort of patients with a mid-stage disease. Um, so long-term trials are really needed to look at sort of the highest, like highest effectiveness dose, and they were they want to look at sort of 2,400 milligrams a day. Um, to really to really provide that kind of recommendation to take to take supplements of coenzyme Q10. So really, the recommendation is that mm, you know we need more evidence to really say that this is going to do a, have have a benefit. Uh, the second one here, creatinine. Again, it's a, sort of a naturally occurring in the body. It supplies energy to the muscle. Um, some early evidence suggests that there's a possible benefit of creatinine in lowering the progression of the disease um, with early stage Parkinson's. Um, a clinical trial, large clinical trial, is actually underway right now to determine the effectiveness um, of creatinine, creatinine. So again, uh, they don't have sort of the type of evidence that they, they like to have in order to give that sort of population recommendation. Vitamin E um, is not naturally occurring in our body. It's something that we get from diet. We typically get vitamin E from things like, it's a fat-based vitamin, um, fat-soluble vitamin. So it's often in things like avocados, like plant-based foods, avocados, um, um, very high in almonds. Um, the recommendation is that, um, again, they looked at the sort of a large clinical trial uh, and the, the supplements, vitamin E supplements appear to have no benefit in delaying the progression or improving motor function of people with Parkinson's disease. So consumption of vitamin E rich foods are recommended for individuals with Parkinson's um, as a diet rich in vitamin E has been shown to be pro uh, protective. Um, if you're taking a multivitamin, um, it should contain less than 30 IUs um, of what's called alpha tocopherol. 
which is vitamin E. So it should really have less than 30 IUs of vitamin E as well as food sources. Um, I, I think it's, it's really important to think about um, sort of herbal supplements, um, vitamin, uh, vitamin supplements, um, not just as sort of benign sort of additions. Um, you should really speak to your uh, pharmacist when you're looking at taking supplements um, because they can often interact with different medications. Um, many of you may have uh, other conditions as well as Parkinson's and um, you may be taking other medications as well and it's, it's extremely important to think about these herbal supplements. A lot of people think, oh, it's just echinacea or something like that, but um, they found that they can often um, interact and um, be detrimental, so it's good to just sort of um, uh, include those in your conversations. And so Sort of the last bullet here is just the best best advice is to eat a balanced, nutritious diet. Um, if you're finding that you know you, you can't eat as well as you'd like to eat, you know absolutely a multivitamin can be just fine. A lot of people uh, really so I have to take some water. I've had this cough that's just lasted for way too long. Um, but people have found that um, nutrition supplement drinks like Ensure or something like that. You know, absolutely, those are fine too, and they can be a, a sort of a good snack on the go or something like that, or if you, you know, want to make your own shakes or something like that. But, um, um, yeah, but absolutely, if you find that you're, you know, you're not eating as well as, you know, you'd like to. But if you typically eat fairly healthy, you know, multivitamin, probably, you know, you can take it. There's not a lot of evidence to say that that's, you know, going to uh, meet all of your, uh, you know, nutrition. I think that a lot of the nutrition that, you know, from vegetables and fruits, all those other things that are not, can't be captured in a multivitamin are, are extremely benef beneficial as well. So, again, the information that I provided today uh, is, can, can, has been brought from Helping BC and Dietitians of Canada. They've synthesized all of this evidence and they, and they continue to sort of monitor the evidence and, and build sort of key, uh, key evidence um, or key practice points is what they call it. Um, if you're looking for more information, um, you can absolutely call and speak to a dietitian free of charge. And you can also find some of what's called sort of health files or information on, on their website. Um, this is two health files here for managing constipation and one for calcium and vitamin D. Um, you know, if you want to look at how you're doing in terms of calcium and vitamin D for bone health. Um, Dietitians of Canada also has a number of resources on their website as well. And, um, you know, you can also look on Dietitians of Canada website to find sort of a local dietitian if you actually wanted to have sort of an in-person consultation with a dietitian in your community. So that's, uh, well, that's actually 45 minutes. So that's kind of where, what I was hoping to... <laughs> do in terms of time. So I can open it up for questions now. Um, I have a few things up here that I thought you might have some questions about. <coughs> but, um, you know, there, there might be other things that you have questions about or... That slide back. <coughs> Which? They wanted, um, they wanted to uh, write down some of the, um, uh, the links. The oh, link, okay. The link one. Oh, yep. Yeah. This one, yeah. yep. And we will also uh, have this presentation on our website um, within uh -oh. a week or so, and I'm so sorry. you can just scroll through to find that. Yeah. This thing just sometimes goes on its own. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a good overview, um, a good, healthy, balanced diet, but then some of the issues that are pertinent in particular to somebody with uh, Parkinson's disease. So our first question. Thanks for your presentation. I'm wondering about magnesium. I've heard uh, rumors that it's a commonly uh, um, a nu nutrient that we're short of or yeah. low in. 
yeah. in our diets. Yeah, when we looked at um, sort of population nutrition surveys, and we've done one in here in BC, as well as one in Canada, and, and overall we do see that people, it, it, it seemed anyway from um, this sort of population study that a lot of people were not getting enough magnesium. Um, and it is something that absolutely you could get, you know, in, in a multivitamin. It's also in a lot of sort of healthy, um, nutritious foods. Magnesium is really, you know, high in nuts and seeds, um, and as well as um, some vegetables and fruits as well. Um, I, I actually, I have this drink that I have. It's called Calm. You get it from a health food store, and it's actually quite high in magnesium. And I, I, I wasn't. I was getting some leg cramps. I was actually pregnant, and I was getting leg cramps. And I started taking this in the evenings, and my leg cramps completely went away. So I think that I was not getting enough magnesium. So you know, absolutely, you could. You know, if you sort of, um, you know, you're not going to get too much magnesium if you were to take a supplement. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think I think they said about 40% of people are not getting enough magnesium. Magnesium is not so easy to absorb. Oh, okay. So. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not um, absolutely sure about that, but I haven't heard about those. Has anyone else tried th that at all? I'll, I'll um, just repeat what she said. She said she uses Epsom gel to rub on your arms, then it absorbs through the skin instead of an oral. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and and is any has anyone else ever heard of a magnesium product of that nature or using it? I wonder if I can make some comments in the spirit of multidisciplinary care. Um, just to cover a few things, first of all about the magnesium. Um, there, this is kind of a hot topic. Uh, one of the problems with magnesium is it's a very small molecule and when you eat it, it tends to stay in your gut and give you diarrhea. That's why it's milk of magnesium, right? Because mm -hmm. that's how it works. So. Uh, but there is some evidence that the brain is deficient in magnesium, mostly due to our Western diet. And the reason we're familiar with this is we teamed up with a professor uh, from China and from Stanford, and they've done some very nice basic science work on showing that at least in rats that have Alzheimer-like symptoms, increasing their magnesium levels improves or reverses many of their symptoms. And they were very interested in doing a study in Parkinson's and they sought us out because we were doing the imaging at Parkinson's. So they've got this uh, material that's called Magteen and it's a supplement that's only available in the US and what it is is basically vitamin C that's glued with magnesium and it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And they've done some preliminary trials in the US uh, for people with Alzheimer's that have been very positive, but they also want to do trials in people with Parkinson's. So we were eager about this and we tried to bring it up in Canada but we ran into all sorts of roadblocks because they, you know, I wanted to do a study in, you know, 20 people with Parkinson's and they thought I was a big multinational pharmaceutical company that was trying to market this stuff in Canada and everyone was saying, you know, you have to speak to Health Canada to get it approved and so on. So, um, you know, I, I was just trying to do a small study where we could image people and, and, and because we have various imaging techniques where we can estimate the amount of magnesium in the brain. And so we wanted to do a study that first of all, A, showed that there was deficiency of magnesium in people with Parkinson's, and then B, after taking this magtine, that it would um, you know, normalize this. Uh, unfortunately, we're still in the bureaucracy and red tape in Ottawa, trying to get that approved. The people who make this stuff uh, in the US are kind of, I, I don't have the time to do that, so they're kind of doing all the, the sort of regulation hoops. But I think magnesium deficiency could be a very hot topic in neurodegenerative disease. So I think it is uh, true to look at that. And I wonder if I could just pick up on some of the other things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So for some of the problems with the gastric slowing, uh, those were excellent suggestions you gave. Um, I will mention that there is a medication that can help this. It's called Domperidone, not the Champagne Domperignon, but Domperidone. <laughs> the trade name for that is Motilium. And often that is used uh, we give it to people um, a half hour before they take their levodopa medication and it helps propel the food along mm -hmm. and uh, that is sometimes helpful. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder if we should also, just between the two of us, clarify what you meant with the protein because I had mentioned the protein right. earlier. Oh, good. So 
um, I think I think what you were saying is it doesn't make sense to be on a total low protein diet. And what I was saying is that you want to make sure the timing of the protein doesn't necessarily interfere with the dosing schedule of your medications. Is that in, are we consistent with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Just you know um, that protein is really optimal for good health, uh, and that um, you know for a very small proportion of people, uh, really sort of redistributing protein all at your sort of your dinner meal is is not the best way uh, to do things, and and really to look at for for most people actually having that sort of throughout the day, and you know working with you know your healthcare team. Um, you know, to, to maximize, you know, talking about timing, absolutely. Um, it's not really um, my expertise around, uh, you know, medication and timing of meals and that, so, um, you know, absolutely you do, but you, you know, you do want to bring that up and talk about that if it's something that you have questions about, for sure. And, and sorry, just a couple of other comments with regards to vitamin D. Uh, so I think your emphasis on vitamin D was with bone health, and there is some suggestion that bone health is under-recognized in Parkinson's and adequate hip health, like whether or not there's a higher incidence of hip fractures in Parkinson's is a very hot topic. But the other thing that's quite hot, actually, is whether or not vitamin D deficiency may may be important for brain health in addition to bone health. For example, uh, particularly in the disease of MS, uh, where as you mentioned, it's you know the, the, the sunshine uh, vitamin. Mm -hmm. And it's always been known that people in northern climates tend to have much higher incidence of MS. And mm -hmm. some of the highest rates of MS are in places like Scotland and probably places like here where it rains all the time. And in fact, there's some suggestion the way um, some people have evolved white skin was because of vitamin D deficiency, that they had to be able to get adequate sunlight when they moved to sort of northern climates. So there is lots of suggestion that um, we need to increase our vitamin D. Uh, most of the concerns about vitamin D is when you take vitamin D plus calcium, and that can give you excessive limits of calcium. But there is some suggestion for the brain health alone increasing the vitamin D is quite helpful. And the upper limits of that is still a bit of a controversy. It you is. gave the Canadian guidelines, Even the uh, Canadian guidelines but some people yeah. have argued that there would be higher. And sorry, the last thing I'll mention about supplements, I think you gave an excellent overview of the supplement. The one supplement that we routinely recommend to a, a significant number of people is melatonin. Mm -hmm. So this is available over the counter, and it's very good for help regulating your sleep-wake cycle. And the REM behavioral movement disorder, when people move excessively at sleep, that is often well treated with melatonin that's available over the counter. So that is one supplement that we often talk about. And lastly, about the vitamin D, they have done studies that show that people with Parkinson's tend to be vitamin D deficient. So when people ask me, you know, what vitamins should I be on? Yeah. I agree, you know, vitamin E has been uh, debunked, coenzyme Q10 has been done, but there is good evidence that most people with Parkinson's are vitamin D deficient, so it's probably yeah, good to and again, about. the general population, really, vitamin D probably are not getting enough vitamin D. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask if um, there was anything that naturally had, uh, uh, oh, what was it she said? Um, it, it was something that, um, oh, it's, um, what was it? It was something that, magnesium. Hmm. Is there anything that has it in it naturally? Yeah, absolutely, but in very small amounts. And um, as, as I think it's Martin there had mentioned, um, our, our diet, sort of a very whole-based diet, so f uh, focusing on, you know, some of the things I talked about, fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole foods, uh, tend to be quite high in magnesium, but what's happened with sort of this North American diet is that a lot of these products have been taken and sort of refined, um, and then magnesium has been removed. But um, a lot of those whole foods, fruits and vegetables, um, nuts and seeds, uh, they all have sort of various amounts of magnesium. Um, and, you know, I think probably your best bet to sort of find those, I don't have sort of like the best foods, kind of the highest magnesium foods at the top of my head, but you could certainly probably go online and either the Dietitians um, of Canada website or even call one of the dietitians at the HealthLink, 
811 phone line and they'd probably sort of, they could actually go through your diet, typical diet with you and sort of look at which foods are highest in magnesium and which ones, you know, you might want to have more of if you're concerned about your magnesium. Yeah. It's, you know, with, with diet, it is nice to sort of have that sort of individualized, you know, advice and sort of looking at that because everyone likes different foods. And I, you know, I would never ever recommend for anyone to eat a food that they didn't like just so that they could get enough magnesium or something like that. You know, food is, is more than just the nutrients. You know, we, and as researchers, we tend to study nutrients, but as people, we eat food. So it's always, you know, it's always translating that into sort of what that means for you and the foods that you like and enjoy to eat and, and you know, can, can eat and work for you, so. We just have time for two more questions here. Sure. In the uh, fight against constipation, and in addition to eating healthy, do you recommend taking a daily dose of Metamucil? Uh, Metamucil, no. Um, Metamucil can ha help not with constipation, but if, you're, if you're, your bowels are quite sort of loose. Um, a lot of people with sort of irritable bowel syndrome find that Metamucil really helps because it hel helps to kind of bung it up a bit. Um, if you're struggling with constipation, it's better to have what they call insoluble fibers. Um, Metamucil is soluble fibers, so the insoluble, the all brand, what I, meant, what I mentioned, um, it can help really to bulk it up more, but again, um, that alone, like it has to be as well with fluids, um, be in adequate fluid to, to really work, yeah. <laughs> Hot oatmeal? Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I don't remember us sending that out, but uh, okay. oatmeal is a good source of fiber. So, yeah, yeah, you know, my absolutely. Mom, we yeah. get that every day and it works. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one, one last question over here. Okay. I have a vitamin D question. Does okay. the use of a um, lamp for seasonal affective disorder fool our bodies into making vitamin D? I, I don't I don't totally know, um, but I don't think so. I think we do need to um, supplement. I, don't, I, I like I think that vitamin D is specific to the sunlight. Um, I don't know that the sun lamps um, do create that vitamin D. I'm not totally sure though. Um, but you know you might need to talk to someone else who has had expertise in those in those particular lamps. Yeah, sorry about that. All right, folks. Well, just to keep us on time here, um, again, Alethea, I think you're going to be here for a little bit through the break, and you're welcome to stay if you want to listen to our last session on mindfulness as well. But if any of you have individual questions you'd like to approach her with, please do. And uh, just join with me in thanking her for the presentation. Thank you.